Hello YouTube. This is a screencast of a presentation that I'm going to be giving at the Algium 2015 GIS Symposium. And it's titled Design, Prep and Production. We're going to be talking about 3D printing Palmy's CBD. Now for those of you not familiar with the concept of 3D printing, this is where we take a three-dimensional digital object and turn it into a physical, usually scaled, model. Five years ago, this kind of technology was still un unusable for most people. But in the last five years, the maker movement has taken place, maker spaces have been popping up all over the world, and 3D printers themselves are a core part of that. Now this has really lowered the bars to entry and people with all kinds of applications are finding uses for it. My case is no exception. I'd just like to show you some of the other projects related to this which have been coming up in recent years all around the, the kind of the design and the future planning of cities. We have, we have this ma mainly being used as a communication and prototyping tool. It's this kind of model, while you can do it 100% digitally, and most of us that work with digital models have been happy to do so, it's really a tool to communicate with others what you're planning to do. So in this case, it's being used by a French company to show how the new apartment block is going to look. In the Forbidden City, it's being used to show tourists where things are. It's no longer enough to have a thematic map. You're having a thematic 3D map for tourism. Now, in Oslo, they've turned 3D printing into a core part of their decision making. So this is now, I believe, mandatory that when they're making a decision about future buildings, they have 3D modeling involved in that. Both 3D printing, that is, and the digital model that you're seeing here. And hey, this is what San Francisco's skyline is going to look at, look like in the future. These are all very pressing issues which cost a lot of money if you get them wrong. And with the price of and the accessibility of 3D printing being so attainable now, it it's hard to say why why wouldn't you do this? Now, in Palmy, the reason we're approaching this problem is we have a problem. We have fantastic 3D data. For those of you who are in the GIS industry, for years and years and years we've been collecting 3D data and we've seen very early on its importance. But trying to change how other professions go about their workflow when they already have an established method is sometimes quite difficult. Here, While we have got access to this wonderful resource, not very many people are actually using it and relying on it in their day-to-day -day lives. And we believe that's largely because the conditions for entry are a little bit too high. We want to lower that bar a bit, get people involved, and then we can show them this stuff. So we have, this is a pre-prepped video model that we will send around. And typically what will happen is people will see the 3D model and they're very interested in it, naturally, and they want to do more. So we're trying to step people through it. So then you can go to maybe Google Earth. We're involving our... F we're showing our 3D data here so people can do fly-throughs on a much easier level. So this is... The previous model was using ArcScene, which is really a bit harder for novices to operate, but Google Earth most people are familiar with. So this is where they go. You can see it, the graphics are a little bit off but that's actually my screen capture software. In Google Earth itself the facades come out brilliantly, the data is really nice and it loads relatively quickly from a KMZ and we are looking at putting this online although we have some licensing to deal with first. Now here, we can see this is how we've actually derived our 
digital 3D models in the first place, this comes from a company called AAM. Uh, they're also the ones with the licenses to it. This is actually on Bing Map. We had this flown a few years ago now. And it's just all area of pictometry, and they've used it to drive automatically a 3D model, which I've then started working from for 3D printing. Actually, I would encourage you to check this out. This is Palmerston North, and it's really nice imagery. From that, they can work out point layers and attach facades from this imagery on top of the model. Now, actually, how did we do this project? Well, this is not kicked off by the GIS department. This is actually came about in a fairly roundabout way. It's in Palmy, we have a really cool library. I mean, they have a piano, they do heaps of community engagement, and one of the ways that they've been trying to engage with the community is using 3D printing. So they have school classes that come in, they have a whole project based around it, so they'll be doing design work from scratch, they'll do their designs, they'll go to the library, get a lecture, learn about 3D modelling, make their design into 3D, and then finally take it all the way through to having it printed. But initially, when they started this project out, they were really worried that they were not going to get such a good reception. So they, they stuck up their hand and said, can anyone help us? And I was like the only one to say, yeah, sure, I've got heaps of cool stuff we can print. So that's how I got access to the 3D printer. But it's also been really great to be involved in the process. So when we, when I was actually there printing out, um, with so much use of the actual printer with all the CBD to print, uh, a few reporters came by and we managed to get the front page, which is a really nice thing to do. Really nice. From a more business perspective, how do you make a business case for this? It seems quite commonly people see this as a, as a toy, and I just want to dissuade you from that. We, we've got a lot of application in planning department, as well as other departments within council, but primarily planning. When you're doing city set, we, we've got um, the team here had a big meeting about it and seeing how they could apply this tool. This is a prototype I put together for them fairly early on. And they came back saying, hey, we want to do that, use this for city central modeling. The environmental team wanted to use this for urban design, possibly at various scales. They want to take. They want to be able to physically take this out to workshop and consultations, in a way that they just could not with digital models. They want to be able to use it to assess the environmental effects of a building. Now, that would include shadows and such. So this is really an early stage tool for that to get people interested and say there's 3D data, and then go and do your proper shadow analysis using a software package designed for that. One of the main suggestions people keep coming up is that they want to highlight where the heritage and the earthquake prone buildings are. And it's been it's genuinely been considered that under the Resource Consents Act Section 5, we may make this a necessary step when planning large scale projects. And I have to say, when the price of failure is so high and the cost of doing a, a scaled model is so low, we may pay as little as ten dollars for a large model. Why wouldn't you? The price of doing it wrong is so great. In addition to that, we have large scale applications which certainly would want to at least be considered in the 3D arena and potentially be 3D printed themselves, as well as many people from front of house displays to library displays and even design-based competitions at schools wanting to get involved at the library. So this is actually the, the prototype I put together early on. I just want to show you it again, just to point out that my boss was very, very confused for a week or so while he couldn't find his desk drawer. And I've actually stolen it here, plastered the imagery over the top, and I've done that because it's steel. So I've attached magnets to the bottom of the models, and so they stick nicely, and you can carry this around quite conveniently, as well as actually being able to put the models in the drawer when you want to, when you're not really using it, or just transporting it. 
So, moving on in this presentation, really, I want to spend the majority of the time talking you through the process, because that's the, really the barrier to doing this, is if you're not familiar with the process itself, which really is easy, but I, I'm going to go through it. As for access, many people will say that they, they actually physically don't have access to a printer, so they're not interested. But actually, if you're in New Zealand, you probably do have access to one. Lots of the libraries are starting to get on board with this. I know Palmy is Auckland City Council's library. I believe they have a 3D printer available. Tauranga, as well as many professional 3D printing shops being opened up and available. So if you only want to do the design side and not actually manage the printer itself, then that's fine these days. Now, from here on, I'd just like to take you through the design process, and if I finish a little bit earlier, then in the actual conference, I think we'll be doing some Palmerston North jigsaw with the pieces. So get stuck in. Now, the first part of this process is really getting that archived data. We'll move on to using SketchUp to correct bits that, are, that need it. Netfab Basic, which is another package, just to close any holes, make sure there's a base on the model, and keep it all nice and tidy. Then finally, I'll show you through one version of an actual printer software, making a slice of the model, and getting the, the extruder to work around each layer properly. And I have plenty of demo videos to show you how and what the printer looks like when it's going. So that when if you come to do this yourself, you're at least at least you're slightly familiar with the process and generally what's going on. And finally, I'll just show you a little image of what I've managed to produce. Um, it's still a work in progress, so I don't really have any great conclusions. But if you're in the workshop, then hopefully you get to take part in Palmerston North Jigsaw. So, in our archive data right now, this is a footprint that we've loaded to our Flex Viewer, just so that you can locate the models that we have easily. And you can see here there are a few problems. We have actually quite large spaces between this building and just a very small connector, so that will probably snap. We have interior walls that don't really need to be there, and actually we have a gap in our model. And the rest looks okay, but we immediately we know we're going to have some work to do. So, into SketchUp, I would just like to show you how I approach that problem. And a lot of this is video, I'm just going to talk over so you can see what I'm doing. Is I'm just looking for interior walls which I can remove without doing any damage. Here, these models have been built into components, so that explode function just makes them more workable, so you can get to the, the lines and the planes that make it up. Google SketchUp is a great tool for this. You just need to make sure that you use the erase tool rather than the delete tool. If you delete it, the pieces will still be there in memory, and that will affect your print quality. So there you can see that I made a bit of a mistake, and I'm just working through this. Now taking out an overhang that really is doing nothing for us. This is maybe a bit, o you don't need necessarily to do quite this much work. But here, you'll see in a moment that I've actually created a few holes in the model, and that's okay, I'm going to deal with those in a different way, just to make sure the edges match up nicely. There we go. Now, having really corrected the bits of the model that jump out at me as being a problem, I'm just going to show you how I've gone about fixing them up. So, dealing with these holes in the model, I'm not really worried too much about the small holes, but you can see where I've done some work to fix up those planes that I took out. Just using the line tool and fill them in. So we've got a nice clean interior of the building. Obviously we have no base on this model yet. And just changing the style there so that we can see a little more clearly without those facades. Now this is the little trick that I found helps a lot is I'm artificially raising up those overhangs because they're not they don't really print very well at that scale they just tend to snap off, so just by thickening them up a little 
I found I got a much better result. Now, let's go into fast forward. I'm going into a ne the next tool in line, which is Netfab Basic. Netfab is all about repairing models specifically for 3D printing. And you can see I've got no base on this model. I've got a few little holes. And I've got some inverted triangles there as well. So you don't necessarily need to fix all of them. But it is nice to fix the majority and make sure there are no... It sure does improve your print quality and just makes it a little bit more consistent. So this is a free tool. You can get the the paid for one as well, but uh, I find the basic repair is quite good. So that's just showing me that I, I've now got a flaw in it. I've completed it. I, I do ha all basically always have warning messages because this is created by using point cloud data. Um, there's always going to be something off, but at the scale that we're talking about, the mistakes are pretty unnoticeable. And as long as it doesn't actually affect the printer working itself, that's okay. And another little trick I found is that in GIS we almost always have elevation data and we very rarely have a flat bottom. So I'm just chopping I think 0 0.3 mils of the bottom of my models to make sure that they uh, come through nicely. And there I just remove that second part, that, that cut off base, and then the main part of the model is all good. So that should come out nicely. And that's all uh, that's all of that. Now, moving on from there, we use this software specifically relates to the three D printer that I'm using, which is a MakerBot five. If you use a commercial printer or even if you use a different piece of hardware, you may not need to do this step. I'm going to show it though just so that we're familiar with the slicing process. Now all we're trying to do here is position the model on the plate and get it ready for print. So I should say again, if you're not going to print yourself and a 3D modeler is going to use this for you, all you really need is an STL file. And that should go into basically any one software. Now this is a MakerBot series and it's just telling us how long it's going to take to print, how much plastic it's going to use, and it's going to show us a basic rundown of how the printer sliced it. So you can see at the top there we've actually got 270 slices. So we're going to build this model layer by layer going up. Now you can start to see the honeycomb shape that's going on in the inside. Now, I think in this one I've spotted a mistake. It's a, a really good process to go through just to make sure that your models are not going to fail. But there, we've got something weird happening here. It looks like there's an overhang in the model. Some of the interior walls possibly have not connected up correctly. So this is a great check. But going from here, this section does look okay. that's how the slicing of your model works and this is just a print file so this will tell the ex the printer where to print and how to print that's all I'm just going to show you a very a quick little demo of some of the things that have been printed and the filament this is the plastic filament that actually feeds into the MakerBot series of course you can print with different materials these days this is your entry level stuff And another important step to using a printer is this is me just leveling the base plate. So that, that blue platform there moves up and down and it needs to be perfectly level. It's just a millimeter or two out on either side or uneven and suddenly everything will be out of proportion. Now all this happens is that extruder there, you see, in the back, is actually just moving around and trying to touch the plate. And then it's just going up and down and making sure that all four sides are evenly leveled. 
so that we don't get any real errors when we're printing. And it go there, and here. Right. Now, when the printer actually begins, one of the key steps is making a base plate that will crack off. And I'd just like to show you how this. So this is the first step of the base plate being made, laying down a base layer of plastic that will actually be able to be removed from the board. And this is the final stage of the base plate. Well, the base plate is important because the base plate is important, and how it comes off because this is actually very, very hot. That's coming out. That extrude ahead is at 215 degrees. C. So it will melt itself fairly firmly to it, and the base plate, that structure really helps it just come off. So I've got two demos here, so volunteers who can catch, and you should hear that come off. Moving to the next. Great. So, thank you for listening to the basic introduction there to how I've approached this. This is what I've come up with so far. This is how I'm. This is how where I'm up to at this point. If you're in the workshop, then right now what I would like to do is try and place these buildings on the map. And if you're not, then please, if any comments, then just leave them below and I'll, I'll try and respond. Thanks for watching.